Hello, I'm Andres Vinelli, and this is a new edition of the Sustainability Story. Today, we are going to look at impact investing in real estate, and specifically, we will focus on affordable housing. Uh, what are the opportunities for investors in this space? What type of asset owners might be attracted to this asset class? This and several other questions will be uh, discussed by Jeff Brenner, who is the president and CEO of Impact Community Capital, an investment advisor advancing opportunity in underinvested communities. Formed in the year 98, 1998, by leading insurance companies, Impact delivers institutional investment solutions to unlock the value for investors while building the necessary infrastructure for underinvested communities. Since its formation a few decades ago, the company has originated over 2 billion investments in 43 states, and in the process of doing so, has created 48,000 units of affordable housing. Jeff, a welcome to the sustainability story. Well, good morning. Thank you, Andres. It's uh, nice to be with you today. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you and explore this interesting area of uh, real estate investing. So what is the, the story of Impact Community Capital? And in particular, what is impact in investing? What does that mean in your particular world? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, you did a great job in the introduction. I felt like maybe you, you weren't going to need me. You, were, you, were, uh, you, you, you nailed it. Yeah, you know, Impact, as you said, started, um, we just last year celebrated our 25th anniversary, and it really came out of the foresight of a group of people working for large insurers who were thinking about how they might be able to make investments that also had a positive impact in communities. You know, the problems that we're trying to address that they were thinking about then like poverty and you know equity and inclusion to try and even attempt at solving those requires lots and lots of capital as large institutional investors they hold a lot of capital so they thought that there might be a role for them to play they obviously have to they're they're handling their policyholders' dollars, so they have to be prudent with those investments. So the idea was, let's go out and create our own investment manager to create investments suitable to our general account portfolios, but very uniquely give them a mandate to create investments that not only produced market rate returns, but had an impact, a positive impact in low-income community. And that was really the genesis of it. And you know, we we proudly like to be able to look back and say we were investing for impact before it became this thing called impact investing. And uh, but you know, to your question about, it, I think quite simply, we think about impact investing as investing, but with the intent of doing something positive with those dollars, in addition to creating returns, creating positive impact in communities. And that's just you know, it's just it's simply investing but with this additional intent of, of positive impact. Interesting. Very interesting. And how did you become involved in this in this effort, Jeff? What's your story? Yeah, wow. And I, I know this isn't a day-long podcast, so I'll try and keep it short. You know, I, I think uh, as a lots of things, a lot of luck, some people that put some faith in me and, and gave me an opportunity and, and also a willingness to take a chance. I was working at a very large institution, a, you know, large regional bank. And an opportunity that came along to, to go interview for a, a small company that was creating a kind of a healthcare lending platform. And the opportunity for me became less about the job than the person. The person I interviewed with, the CEO of this, this small, it was then probably a 10 person company, just had a, a vision about making change, creating change. And it was different than anything I'd been exposed to in just, you know, kind of this straight corporate finance world that I was working in. And so I thought, well, let me let me just go learn from this person for a couple of years. She she was a different type of leadership than I had been around. And I thought, you know, 
this will probably really help me in my career long term, you know, to be exposed to that. But I thought I'd only go work there for a couple of years to just kind of learn again this person, this leadership, and then go back to what I really enjoyed doing in finance. That two years turned into 18 years. And now, gosh, almost 30 years, hate to admit that, but almost 30 years. And it's really because of the opportunity to take what I love doing in, in finance, but use that to also make a difference. And, you know, I, I always go back to in, in, even in days that don't go so well at the office, you can always walk away going, yeah, but we're trying to do something really positive. And I enjoy working with a group of people that, that, that hold that, that same kind of desire in their careers. And Jeff, uh, what's from the beginning, the, the vision there on providing low-income housing finance, or did it morph over, over the years, this, this vision? Yeah, it's, it has evolved. I, you know, I don't, I, I think when, you know, as I said, when they were first thinking about it, I don't think that there was they said, let's go finance affordable housing. I think they said, let's figure out what the opportunity was. And the person that they hired, the founding CEO, Dan Sheehy, came out of from New York with a lot of experience in housing finance and for insurance companies, investing in commercial real estate and multifamily housing was something that they knew. And this was just an added element of investing in affordable multifamily housing. So the first thing they did is they went out and and purchased a portfolio of about $40 million of mortgages. And then they purchased a second portfolio. And then the idea became, how do we do this in scale? And they said, well, let's use a traditional capital markets tool. Let's take these mortgages. Let's create a commercial mortgage-backed security. And let's and then, then let, let's create a security that other investors are used to investing in and let's give them the opportunity to invest in it and that will bring more you know more attention more dollars into the space and as we kind of like to say lather rinse and repeat and so it, it was really out of that purchase of a portfolio then the idea evolved well we can do this on a programmatic basis and again they they the, these investors put their money where their mouth is. They put a very significant credit facility available, made available to impact community capital to go out and work to originate these mortgages, aggregate them into larger pools, and then securitize. And so that really was the jumping off point for, you know, as what you said earlier now, over $2 billion of investments and and probably about a billion and a half of that in affordable housing. Are you still originating mortgages? Yeah, we originated, we committed to about $300 million of new mortgages in 2023. And, and that's, a, that's, that's the big part of our growth plan going forward. The need is huge. It's almost insatiable for access to affordable housing. And, you know, we think we found a way to create a product that, as we said, is it's programmatic, can be replicated, we can do it in scale. And that's, you know, that's a real need for institutional investors. They, you know, they tend to write pretty big checks. They have lots of capital to invest. And so that continues to be a big part of our program. I've read that the shortage for affordable housing is, is, is large. Some estimates put it around 7 million homes that, that I need it and serving more than 10 million low-income families in the U.S. Is the right assumption to think that this is a, for practical purposes, an infinite market? <laughs> How big is this opportunity uh, from your perspective? Yeah, no, you're, you're exactly right. I think last year, the National Low-Income Housing Coalition, they, they do a study every year. And the number that you're citing, um, there's a gap of over 7 million affordable and available rental homes that are that are needed to, to, to house people looking for affordable housing. For extremely low income renters, people making, you know, a less much 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 less than 50% of area median income, there's only 33 affordable rental homes for every 100 households that are searching. 
there's some other really if, if it just I, I think incredible stats um if, if if i can can share them with you i think it is and again this comes out of the 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 same reports that there is no county metro area or state where a person person that's earning the federal local minimum wage can afford a, a modest two bedroom home no county in the, in the entire country most of these workers can only only about uh, the, the, these these workers can only afford a one bedroom home in about 9% of the counties that we live in and for people making minimum wage they have to work about 96 hours on average to afford a one bedroom home so i think yeah it's you know as, as we said it, it, the demand the need for it is almost insatiable and you know particularly in the past year costs have gotten higher to build this with inflation so it's a it's an intractable problem interesting and the size the magnitude of this issue affecting common man and woman around the, the US and I suspect in, in many other countries certainly call for for policy attention on this but I would like to focus rather than on the sort of public policy side of things for this moment I would love to focus on what the private sector can can do in this space and let me ask you about the the economic opportunity for investors is this a profitable market to enter because needs are are insatiable in many ways, right? Is there is there a are there vehicles that that provide a a risk to return characteristics in your space? So what what are the economic characteristics of this financing that you are supplying? Yeah, I mean, you know, let me talk about it in terms of why our investors like this product. So you know they've been doing it for twenty five years, right? And and as I said from the outset, the mandate when they formed Impact was to create investments that were suitable to their general accounts, which means they had to produce market rate returns relative to the risk. So we had to we had to take that approach into creating those investments. And now they've done it for 25 years. So I think it's it's proved out that you can do that. Why do they do it? Well, for our primary investors for insurance companies and life insurance companies in particular, they have long dated liabilities. So they're looking for long dated assets to match against those liabilities. And so the affordable housing, financing affordable housing, and we invest in, you know, mortgages that are, are 15 to 18 year mortgages with 30 to 40 year amortization. So these are very long dated assets. So that matches up really well. They have bond-like attributes in that they produce very stable cash flows. They're really suitable for for a low risk sleeve. I mean, it's kind of interesting when you think about it, right? It's 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 it's, it's affordable housing, right? And you tend to think oh, that must be high risk, and it's the opposite. It's not. It it tends to be very low risk. That, as I said, provides stable cash flows. It tends to be have a low correlation to other fixed income pieces in their portfolio. And, you know, there's a there's a lack of cyclicality to this investment. And what I mean by that is, you know, this product, this investment performs across cycles. And then we've demonstrated that over 25 years. The great financial crisis, we didn't have any losses. Going through COVID, we didn't have any issues in our portfolio. If you look back at studies that have been done by Cohn Resnick, looking at in particular the low income housing tax credit financing, cumulatively over the 20 plus history, a year plus, plus history of the program, they've had 57 basis points, 57 basis points cumulatively of losses. We've had of the, the two, the billion and a half that we've done, we've had less than $500,000 of losses. And most of that's in transactional expenses. And you go, well, you know, how does that happen? Well, it, it, you think about it, if we're in um, a strong economic environment, that usually means the cost of housing is going up, rents are going up. So if you're in a stable, affordable housing, you're going to stay. 
And on the flip side, if we're in a down economic cycle, that generally means that incomes are down, that unemployment is up. And if you're in affordable housing, you're going to stay. So the renter base is very, very steady. It's sticky. And so that's what really leads to these kind of, as I said, bond-like attributes of, of very stable cash flows and very low risk. Are we talking basically about uh, rentals or is it both? So, so for impact, we're only in the rental market, the affordable multifamily rental space. Yes. Interesting. So perhaps we need to refine our narrative, the, the story that we build, the story that I, that I personally have in my head, perhaps until today, is that the great financial crisis showed that, that housing you know, was also vulnerable in, in, in low-income housing too, in particular with all the stories about folks overextending themselves and, and getting into mortgage products that they didn't necessarily understand that were obtuse, obtusely described products, right? So I have that narrative in my head, but admittedly, that's the ownership side of, of home. But if you're talking about rentals, there's that flip side of the story. That's very did that did that occur in just in your portfolios or was that a uh, something that would generalize about rental behavior during times of economic stress? No, I think you know again is if if you go back to the studies from Cohn Resnick and they're looking. This isn't just our portfolio. They're looking across all of the low income housing tax credit transactions that have been done and you look cumulatively over a 25 year period 20 year period and they've only you know there's been a cumulative losses of only 57 basis points you know i think that clearly demonstrates that it's a very low risk product and i think you know to to your point without you know without getting too you know on my soapbox or too political i mean you know what happened in the great financial crisis in a lot of ways came out of, you know, greed and just over-engineering. As you said, putting people into loan products that weren't appropriate to them. And that just really drove costs and valuations up. And, but I think, you know, home, I mean, home ownership, if you, if you look at, at statistics that, you know, the, the agencies, Freddie and Fannie, you know, have put out, tends to perform really well, as long as you put people into good loans, right? You know, good, good financial, help them make good financial decisions. Now, your investor base, at least at the beginning, was, and maybe still is, insurance companies. And it seems to me like a very suitable investment, hedges a big chunk of your liabilities, and if the returns are in line with what it Back there, that's a very natural product, and 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 perhaps explains the institutional success that Impact has had these decades. Now, I would imagine that other uh, type of asset owners, perhaps endow, you know, university endowments or pension funds, might also look at this asset class with interest. What what has been your experience? with those asset owners? Have you reached out to, to them with your products? Yeah, it's a great question. Only, we're just scratching the surface. I mean, I think, you know, we've really only scratched the surface in the insurance sector. I mean, this, you know, this, you know, as, as you were talking about earlier, and, and I think it's, it's a really important point, there's a lot of misperception about this thing called impact investing. I think, you know, it's really a developing industry. You know, you asked at the very beginning, what is, you know, what does impact investing mean? And, you know, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And, and there's also a lot of misperceptions about it. So I think, you know, a lot of people hear the term impact investing and one of the first things they think is, oh, I've got to give up yield or return in order to make this investment. I think we've demonstrated and others that, that that's not the case. So that's why there's in the last few years been really increasing interest on the part of the broader institutional investment community 
to look at into impact investing. So I think, yeah, we, you know, we hope really, really hope that as we grow, we'll bring more institutional investors beyond the insurance industry, as you talked about, corporates, foundations, endowments into this space. And, you know, we, we're going to be working on some new strategies that in, in the next couple of years that we think will provide really interesting and attractive entrance points for this broader group of institutional investors. Interesting. So if the risk profile characteristics of, of these assets is roughly in line with what, you know, what the market is offering, I would imagine also that this type of products offer the additional advantage that could be intangible, right? This idea that you're actually helping out folks have a decent place to, to live, you know. But I wonder if there are other advantages to, to, to doing this, right? In this day and age, you know, corporations have to show that they are doing something for their communities and for their employees. So maybe in the regulatory space, this this can help out. So I wonder what these other advantages are that cannot be neatly summarized in a CFA <laughs> approved, you know, risk return analysis in a portfolio. So what are these other because I hate to, to think of it, this as something that it just has a feel good aspect to it, although it does, and certainly at uh, least to you know to. Yeah, no, it, it's. I think you're 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 asking probably the most important question, and it, it's interesting. We were just talking to one of our investors about this yesterday, is because we we were actually talking about work from home, which you know I think both of us are probably you know might be doing today. And, you know, one of the reasons that people want to work from home is because they're spending an hour or plus commuting to work every day. And take where I live in the Bay Area, where our office is in San Francisco. You know, most people that work in San Francisco can't afford to live in San Francisco. And so when it means that I've got to go I got to take an hour just to get to work in the morning. That's an hour I'm not working, right? That, that's an hour I'm not with my family. And so one of these we were talking about, and we've talked a lot about to investors about is, you know, don't just think of investing in affordable housing in an abstract way. Thinking about investing in affordable housing that gives your employees an affordable place to live. And, now suddenly, maybe if they're within 15 minutes of work, they want to come into the office. It's it's not it's not a huge burden on their day to commute into the office. The other aspect to it, really practical aspect, is, you know, again, I, I, I referenced the Low Income Housing Coalition earlier, and in that same study, 44 percent of Americans are spending more than 30 percent of their income on housing. And 30% is kind of the, 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 the rule of thumb that you really shouldn't spend more than 30% of your income on housing. Yet nearly almost half of the country is spending more of their income on housing. Something like 20%, so almost one-fifth of the country is spending over 50% of their income on housing costs. Well, if they're doing that, then... Take it for, you know, for our investors, they, you know, they can't afford to buy life insurance. They might not be able to afford to, to, to access health insurance. It's certainly making it more difficult to go into their communities and shop and, you know, go to, go to restaurants and, and spend money in other places. And more importantly, they're making critical decisions between, do I pay the utilities this month or do I pay the childcare bill this month and cutting back and spending in other other areas? So it's it's about also investing in affordable housing is just about investing in the economy in general. So people have dollars to spend in other places and can live closer to work and then want to be in the office. It's interesting. Uh, it occurred to me that there might be a climate aspect to this or a carbon footprint aspect to this, right? In that 
if folks spend a lot of their time commuting, not only it's a pain in the neck in terms of lost productivity and, you know, having the opportunity cost of not spending that time with your personal affairs, your family, what have you, but also that's a lot of carbon footprint. And, and now that corporations in general, I would say, are paying closer attention to the issue, it bit might become more of a central aspect to it. California recently requiring for businesses to take into account their carbon footprint, disclose some of those, including costs that are totally in, indirect, like, like people commuting back and forth, right? That's part of the carbon fo- footprint of any corporation. So I wonder if this has a net positive or or what's the 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 foot the carbon footprint implication of people actually being able to 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 rent in more convenient places. Yeah, no, I I think that's a great point. I mean, obviously if if you can, you know, build live work communities where where people can walk to work or you know, one of the things that that we look at in assessing our investments is, you know, what's the proximity to public transportation? Can people get easy access to public transportation to, to go to work or to go to the doctor or, you know, wherever they need to, to, to get to on a day-to-day basis? So, you know, that's an element of it. And, you know, it, it has a practical risk analysis, if you will, in that when we look at our projects, one of the things that we're evaluating is the energy efficiency of the products. You know, are they installing solar? Are they installing high energy efficiency appliances? You know, do they have the ability to, you know, for water recapture and use potable water to, you know, water landscaping and that sort of thing? And not only is it an important environmental consideration, but One of the critical aspects of well-performing affordable housing investments is keeping the operating costs low. And if you're energy efficient, you're keeping your operating costs low, which means that these investments are going to perform better over the long term. So it has a really important environmental aspect to it, carbon footprint, as you said. And it also has just a practical underwriting piece to it. it. It's an important component to looking at it and saying, can they keep costs down? Because again, if this is affordable housing, you're trying not to raise rent. Right. And so then the only way you can make a buck if you're not raising rents is to keep costs down. Right. And that's an important component to it. Absolutely. And this is an example of how financial sector can deliver solutions to to address many you know, issues in, in society and get paid appropriately to you know, by doing so in an efficient manner. So right. we are about to finish here. I, I was wondering, Jeff, if you can discuss the future challenges for this field. Are there ways that investors can get involved in this field? Are there different ways for, for doing? Yeah. I, I, you know, as I said, it's a developing field, right? The, the term impact investing has a lot of different interpretations, understanding. So part of it is getting investors, getting us all on the same page. What's it mean? What's it look like? There can be a lot of different types of impact and, and it can be defined a lot of a lot of different ways. And so I think one, it it's trying to make sure that we're using consistent language, consistent, you know, nomenclature to, to talk about it. I think, you know, for investors, they should look for managers and hold managers accountable in the if around impact the same way they do around risk and return, right? When a manager goes to an institutional investor and makes an investment pitch, we're pitching an investment strategy and we're talking about risk and return. And we create metrics to be held to those return targets. Well, it's the same thing. If we go in and we pitch an investment the, or an impact thesis alongside it, we should be held to measuring that impact and are we achieving that impact performance? And I think the other big challenge is in being clear about how we're me- how we're defining and measuring impact and avoiding the greenwashing that can come along with it because 
it has become interesting to institutional investors. So, you know, it's becoming, you know, it's been something that, that, you know, a lot of managers are claiming to do. And I think our industry gets hurt if someone is purporting to do impact investing and it doesn't meet the smell and feel test. So that's why I think, you know, institutional investors have, the, they have the money, right? So they're the, they're the ones in charge. So I think it's holding their managers and themselves accountable to measuring impact with the same diligence in which they would measure risk and return. Fantastic. So Jeff Brenner, president and CEO of FinBank Community Capital, I think that the trajectory of, of your organization and the peers are really showing that real estate investing through the lens of impact investing can produce market-like returns with reasonable uh, risks, and you have discovered the opportunity of low-income housing as a long-term investment. So, Jeff, thank you for sharing your story and your, your insights. Yeah, what a real pleasure. Thank you, and thank you for giving us an opportunity to talk a little bit about it. Fantastic. Thank you, Jeff. And we look forward to another episode of Sustainability Story. Thank you.